The Sound of Waves, Chapter 8 A day of rest from fishing never seemed to come. Finally, two days after Hiroshi left on the school excursion, the island was struck by such a storm that no boats could put out. It seemed that not one of the island's meagre cherry blossoms, just then beginning to open, could escape destruction. On the previous day, an unseasonably damp wind had enveloped and clung to the sails, and at sunset, a strange light had spread over the sky. A groundswell set in. The beach was a roar with incoming waves. The sea lice and dango bugs scurried for high ground. During the night, a high wind came blowing, mixed with rain, and the heavens and the sea were filled with sounds like human shrieks and shrilling fifes. Shinji listened to the voice of the storm from his pallet. It was enough to tell him the boats wouldn't put out today. This would be too much even for braiding rope or repairing fishing tackle. Perhaps too much even for the Young Men's Association's rat-catching project. Not wanting to waken his mother, whose breathing from the next pallet told him she was still asleep, Shinji thoughtfully kept still, waiting eagerly for the first greyness at the window. The house was shaking violently and the windows were rattling. Somewhere a sheet of tin fell with a great clatter. The houses on Utajima, the big rich houses as well as the tiny one-storey houses such as Shinji's, were all built alike, with the entrance into a dirt-floored workroom flanked by the toilet room on the left and the kitchen on the right, and amid the wind's fury in the pre-dawn blackness, there was a single odour that dominated the entire house, hanging quietly on the air inside, that darkish, cold, meditative odour of the toilet room. The window, which faced the wall of the next-door neighbour's storehouse, slowly turned grey. Shinji looked up at the pouring rain, beating upon the eaves and spreading wetly across the window panes. Before, he had hated days when there was no fishing, days that robbed him both of the pleasure of working and of income. But now the prospect of such a day seemed the most wonderful of festival days to him. It was a festival made glorious, not with blue skies and flags waving from poles topped with golden balls, but with a storm, raging seas, and a wind that shrieked as it came tearing through the prostrate treetops. Finding it unbearable to wait, the boy leapt from bed and jerked on a pair of trousers and a black crew neck sweater full of holes. A moment later, his mother awakened to see the dark shadow of a man against the window, faintly lit with dawn. Hey, who's there? she shouted. Me. Oh, don't scare me so. Today, in weather like this, you're going fishing? The boats won't be going out, but... Oh then, why not sleep a little longer? Why, I thought it was some stranger at the window. The mother was not far wrong in the first thought she had had upon opening her eyes. Her son did indeed seem a stranger this morning. Here he was, this Shinji who almost never opened his mouth, singing at the top of his voice and making a show of gymnastics by swinging from the door lintel. Not knowing the reason for her son's strange behaviour and fearing he would pull the house down, his mother grumbled, If it's a storm outside, what else is it we've got right here inside the house? Countless times, Shinji went to peer up at the sooty clock on the wall. With a heart unaccustomed to doubting, he never wondered for an instant whether the girl would brave such a storm to keep their rendezvous. He knew nothing of that melancholy and all too effective way of passing time by magnifying and complicating his feelings, whether of happiness or uneasiness, through the exercise of the imagination. When he could no longer bear the thought of waiting, Shinji flung on a rubber raincoat and went down to meet the sea. It seemed to him that only the sea would be kind enough to answer his wordless conversation. Raging waves rose high above the breakwater, set up a tremendous roar and then rushed on down. Because of the previous evening's storm warning, every last boat had been pulled up much higher on the beach than usual. When the giant waves receded, the surface of the water tilted steeply. It almost seemed as if the bottom of the sea inside the harbour works would be exposed to view. Spray from the waves, mixed with the driving rain, struck Shinji full in the face. The sharp, fresh saltiness ran down his flushed cheeks, down the lines of his nose, and Shinji recalled the taste of Hatsu's lips. The clouds were moving at a gallop, and even in the dark sky there was a restless fluctuation between light and dark. Once in a while, still deeper in the sky, Shinji caught glimpses of clouds charged with an opaque light, like promises of clear skies to come. 
but these would be effaced almost instantly. Shinji was so intent upon the sky that a wave came right up to where he stood and wet the toe thongs of his wooden clogs. At his feet there lay a beautiful small pink shell, apparently just washed up by the same wave. He picked the shell up and examined it. It was perfectly formed without even the slightest chip on its paper thin edge. Deciding it would make a good present, he put it in his pocket. Immediately after lunch, Shinji began getting ready to go out again. Seeing him going out into the storm for a second time, the mother paused in her dishwashing to stare fixedly after him. But she didn't venture to ask where he was going. There was something about her son's back that warned her to keep silent. How she regretted she had not had at least one daughter who would always have been at home to help her with the housework. Men go out fishing. They board their coasting ships and carry cargo to all sorts of ports. Women, not destined for that wide world, cook rice, draw water, gather seaweed, and when summer comes, dive into the water, down to the sea's deep bottom. Even for a mother who was a veteran among diving women, this twilight world of the sea's bottom was the world of women. All this she knew. The interior of a house dark even at noon, the sombre pangs of childbirth, the gloom at the bottom of the sea. These were the series of interrelated worlds in which she lived her life. The mother remembered one of the women of the summer before last, a widow like herself, a frail woman still carrying a nursing child. The woman had come up from diving for abalone and had suddenly fallen unconscious as she stood before the drying fire. She had turned up the whites of her eyes, bitten her blue lips and dropped to the ground. When her remains were cremated at twilight in the pine grove, the other diving women had been filled with such grief that they couldn't stand, but squatted on the ground, weeping. A strange story had been told about that incident, and some of the women had become afraid to dive any more. It was said that the dead woman had been punished for having seen a fearful something at the bottom of the sea, a something that humans are not meant to see. Shinji's mother had scoffed at the story and had dived to greater and greater depths to bring up the biggest catches of the season. She had never been one to worry about unknown things. Even such recollections as these couldn't dent her natural cheerfulness. She felt boastful about her own good health and the storm outside quickened her feeling of well-being, just as it had her son's. Finishing the dishwashing, she opened wide the skirts of her kimono and sat down with her bare legs stretched out in front of her, gazing at them earnestly in the dim light from the creaking windows. There wasn't a single wrinkle on the sunburnt, well-ripened thighs, their wonderfully rounded flesh all but gleaming with the colour of amber. Like this, I could still have four or five children more. But at the thought, her virtuous heart became filled with contrition. Quickly tidying her clothing, she bowed before her husband's memorial tablet. The path the boy followed up to the lighthouse had been turned into a mountain torrent by the rain, washing away his footprints. The tops of the pine trees howled. His rubber boots made walking difficult and, as he carried no umbrella, he could feel the rain running down his close-cropped hair and into his collar. But he kept on climbing his face to the storm. He wasn't defying the storm. Instead, in exactly the same way that he felt a quiet happiness when surrounded by the quietness of nature, his feelings now were in complete concord with nature's present fury. He looked down through the pine thicket at the sea, where countless white caps were tearing in. From time to time, even the high rocks at the tip of the promontory were covered by the waves. Passing women's slope, Shinji could see the one-storied lighthouse residence kneeling in the storm, all its windows closed, its curtains drawn fast. He climbed on up the stone steps towards the lighthouse. There was no sign of a watchman within the fast shut watch house. Inside the glass doors, which streamed with driven rain and rattled ceaselessly, there stood the telescope, turned blankly toward the closed windows. There were papers scattered from the desk by the drafts, a pipe, a regulation coast guard cap, the calendar of a steamship company showing a gaudy painting of a new ship, and on the same wall with the calendar a pair of drafting triangles hanging nonchalantly from a nail. Shinji arrived at the observation tower drenched to the skin. The storm was all the more fearful at such a deserted place. Here, almost at the summit of the island, 
With nothing to intervene between naked sky and earth, the storm could be seen reigning in supreme dominion. The ruined building, its windows gaping wide in three directions, gave not the slightest protection against the wind. Rather, it seemed as though the tower were inviting the tempest into its rooms, and there abandoning it to the revel. The immense view of the Pacific from the second floor windows was reduced in sweep by the rain clouds, but the way the waves, raging and ripping out their white linings on every hand, faded off into the encircling black clouds made the turbulent expanse seem instead to be boundless. The boy went back down the outside staircase and peered into the room on the ground floor where he had come before to get his mother's firewood. It had apparently been used originally as a storehouse, and its windows were so tiny that only one of them had been broken. He saw that it offered ideal shelter. The mountain of pine needles that had been there before had apparently been carried away bale by bale until now only four or five bales remained in a far corner. It's like a jail, Shinji thought, noticing the mouldy odour. No sooner had he taken shelter from the storm than he was suddenly conscious of a wet cold feeling. He sneezed hugely. Taking off his raincoat, he felt in the pocket of his trousers for the matches that life at sea had taught him always to carry with him. Before he found the matches, his fingers touched the shell he had picked up on the beach that morning. He took it out now and held it up toward the light of a window. The pink shell was gleaming lustrously, as though it might have been still wet with seawater. Satisfied, the boy returned the shell to his pocket. He gathered dried pine needles and brushwood from a broken bale, heaped them on the cement floor, and with much difficulty succeeded in lighting one of the damp matches. Then, for a time, the room was completely filled with smoke, until at last the dismal smouldering broke into a tiny flame and began to flicker. The boy took off his sodden trousers and hung them near the fire to dry. Then he sat down before the fire and clasped his knees. Now there was nothing to do but wait. Shinji waited. Without the slightest uneasiness, he whiled away the time by poking his fingers into the holes in his black sweater, making them still larger. He became lost in the sensations of his body as it gradually became warm and in the voice of the storm outside. He surrendered himself to the euphoria created by his trusting devotion itself. The fact that he was lacking in the ability to ma imagine all sorts of things that might keep the girl from coming didn't trouble him in the least. And thus it was that he laid his head on his knees and fell asleep. When Shinji opened his eyes, the blazing fire was there before him, burning as brightly as ever, as though he had only closed his eyes the moment before. But a strange, indistinct shadow was standing across the fire from him. He wondered if he were dreaming. It was a naked girl who stood there, her head bent low, holding a white chemise to dry at the fire. Standing as she was, the chemise held down toward the fire with both hands, she was revealing the whole upper half of her body. When he realised that this was certainly no dream, the idea occurred to Shinji that, by using just a little cunning and pretending to be still asleep, he could watch her through half-closed eyes. And yet, her body was almost too beautiful to be watched without moving at all. Diving women are accustomed to drying their entire bodies at a fire upon coming out of the water. Hence, Hatsu had apparently not given the matter a second thought upon doing so now. When she arrived at the meeting place, there the fire was, and there the boy was, fast asleep. So, making up her mind as quickly as a child, she evidently had decided to waste no time in drying her wet clothes and her wet body while the boy slept. In short, the idea that she was undressing in front of a man had never crossed her mind. She was simply undressing before a fire because this happened to be the only fire there was, because she was wet. If Shinji had had more experience with women, as he looked at the naked Hatsu standing there across the fire in the storm-encircled ruins, he would have seen unmistakably that hers was the body of a virgin. Her skin, far from fair complexioned, had been constantly bathed in seawater and stretched smooth. And there, upon the wide expanse of a chest that had served for many long dives, two small, firm breasts turned their faces slightly away from each other, as though abashed, and lifted up two rose-coloured buds. 
Since Shinji, fearful of being discovered, had barely opened his eyes, the girl's form remained a vague outline, and, peered at through a fire that reached as high as the concrete ceiling, became almost indistinguishable from the wavering flames themselves. But then the boy happened to blink his eyes, and for an instant the shadow of his lashes, magnified by the firelight, moved across his cheeks. Quick as thought, the girl hid her breasts with the white chemise, not yet completely dry, and cried out, Keep your eyes shut! The honest boy immediately clamped his eyes tightly shut. Now that he thought about it, it had certainly been wrong of him to pretend to be still sleeping. But then, was it his fault that he had waked up when he did? Taking courage from this just and fair reasoning, for a second time he opened wide his black, beautiful eyes. Completely at a loss as to what to do, the girl still had not even so much as started putting on her chemise. Again she cried out in a sharp, childlike voice, Keep your eyes shut! But the boy no longer made the slightest pretense at closing his eyes. Ever since he could remember, he had been used to seeing the women of this fishing village naked, but this was the first time he'd ever seen the girl he loved naked, and yet he couldn't understand why, just because she was naked, a barrier should have risen between them, making difficult the everyday civilities, the matter-of-course familiarities. With the straightforwardness of youth, he rose to his feet. The boy and girl faced each other then, separated by the flames. The boy moved slightly to the right. The girl retreated a little to the right also, and there the fire was, between them, forever. What are you running away for? Why, because I'm ashamed. The boy didn't say, then why don't you put your clothes on? If only for a little longer he wanted to look at her. Then, feeling he must say something, he burst out with a childish question. What would make you quit being ashamed? To this the girl gave a truly naive answer, though a startling one. If you took your clothes off too, then I wouldn't be ashamed. Now Shinji was at a complete loss. But after an instant's hesitation, he began taking off his crew neck sweater, saying not a word. Struck by the thought that Hatsu might run away while he was undressing, he kept a lookout that was scarcely broken even during the instant when the sweater passed over his face. Then his nimble hands had the sweater off and thrown aside, and there stood the naked figure of a young man, far handsomer than when dressed, wearing only a narrow loincloth, his thoughts turned so ardently upon the girl opposite him that for a moment his body had completely lost its sense of shame. Now you're not ashamed anymore, are you? He flung the question at her as though cross-examining a witness. Without realising the enormity of what she was saying, the girl gave an amazing explanation. Yes. Why? You, you, you still haven't taken everything off. Now the sense of shame returned, and in the firelight the boy's body flushed crimson. He started to speak, and choked on the words. Then, drawing so near the fire that his fingertips were all but burnt, and staring at the girl's chemise, which the flame set swaying with shadows, Shinji finally managed to speak. If, if you'll take that away, I will too. Hatsu broke into a spontaneous smile but neither she nor Shinji had the slightest idea what the meaning of her smile might be. The white chemise in the girl's hands had been half covering her body, from breast to thigh. Now she flung it away behind her. The boy saw her, and then, standing just as he was, like some piece of heroic sculpture, never taking his eyes from the girl's, he untied his loincloth. At this moment, the storm suddenly planted its feet wide and firmly outside the windows. All along, the wind and rain had been raging madly around the ruins with the same forces now. But in this instant, the boy and girl realised the certainty of the storm's existence, realised that directly beneath the high windows, the wide Pacific was shaking with everlasting frenzy. The girl took a few steps backward. There was no way out. The city concrete wall touched her back. Hatsu, the boy cried, jump across the fire to me. Come on, if you'll jump across the fire to me. The girl was breathing hard, but her voice came clearly, firmly. The naked boy didn't hesitate an instant. 
he sprang from tiptoe and his body, shining in the flames, came flying at full speed into the fire. In the next instant, he was directly in front of the girl. His chest lightly touched her breasts. Firm softness. This is the firm softness that I imagined the other day under that red sweater, he thought in a turmoil. They were in each other's arms. The girl was the first to sink limply to the floor, pulling the boy after her. Pine needles. They hurt, the girl said. The boy reached out for the white chemise and tried to pull it under the girl's body. She stopped him. Her arms were no longer embracing him. She drew her knees up, crushed the chemise into a ball in her hands, thrust it down below her waist, and exactly like a child who had just thrown cupped hands over an insect in the bushes, doggedly protected her body with it. The words which Hatsu spoke next were weighted with virtue. It's bad, it's bad. It's bad for a girl to do that before she's married. You really think it's so bad? The crestfallen boy asked without any conviction. It's bad. As the girl's eyes were closed, she could speak without hesitation, in a tone of voice that seemed to be both reproving and placating. It's bad for now, because I've decided it's you I'm going to marry. Until I do, it's really bad. Shinji had a sort of haphazard respect for moral things, and even more because he had never yet known a woman. He believed he had now penetrated to the moralistic core of women's being. He insisted no further. The boy's arms were still embracing the girl. They could hear each other's naked throbbing. A long kiss tortured the unsatisfied boy, but then, at a certain instant, this pain was transformed into a strange elation. From time to time, the dying fire crackled a little. They heard this sound and the whistling of the storm as it swept past the high windows, all mixed with the beating of their hearts. To Shinji, it seemed as though this unceasing feeling of intoxication and the confused booming of the sea outside and the noise of the storm among the treetops were all beating with nature's violent rhythm. And as part of his emotion, there was the feeling, forever and ever, of pure and holy happiness. He moved his body away from hers. Then he spoke in a manly, composed tone of voice. Today on the beach, I found a pretty shell and brought it for you. Oh, thanks. Let me see it. Getting up, Shinji went to where his clothes had fallen and began putting them on. At the same time, Hatsu softly pulled on her chemise and then put on the rest of her clothes. After they were both fully dressed, the boy brought the shell to where the girl was sitting. My, it is pretty. Delighted, the girl mirrored the flames in the smooth face of the shell. Then she held it up against her hair and said, it looks like coral, doesn't it? Wonder if it wouldn't even make a pretty hair ornament. Shinji sat down on the floor close beside the girl. Now that they were dressed, they could kiss in comfort. When they started back, the storm still hadn't abated, so this time Shinji didn't part from her above the lighthouse, didn't take a different path out of deference to what the people in the lighthouse might think. Instead, together they followed the slightly easier path that led down past the rear of the lighthouse. Then, arm in arm, they descended the stone stairs leading from the lighthouse past the residence. Chiyoko had come home, and by the next day was overcome with boredom. Not even Shinji came to see her. Finally, a regular meeting of the etiquette class brought the village girls to the house. There was an unfamiliar face among them. Chiyoko realised this must be the Hatsu of whom Yasuo had spoken, and she found Hatsu's rustic features even more beautiful than the islanders said they were. This was an odd virtue of Chiyoko's. Although a woman with the slightest degree of self-confidence will never cease pointing out another woman's defects, Chiyoko was even more honest than a man in always recognising anything beautiful about any woman except herself. With nothing better to do, Chiyoko had begun studying her history of English literature. Knowing not a single one of their works, she memorised the names of a group of Victorian lady poets. Christina Georgina Rossetti, Adelaide Anne Proctor, Jean Ingelow, Augusta Webster, exactly as though she were memorising Buddhist scriptures. Rote memorisation was Chiyoko's forte. Even the professor's sneezes were recorded in her notes. Her mother was constantly at her side, eager to gain new knowledge from her daughter. 
going to the university had been Chiyoko's idea in the first place, but it had been her mother's enthusiastic support that had overcome her father's reluctance. Her thirst for knowledge, whetted by a life of moving from lighthouse to lighthouse, from remote island to remote island, the mother always pictured her daughter's life as an ideal dream. Never once did her eyes perceive her daughter's little inner unhappiness. On the morning of the storm, both mother and daughter slept late. The storm had been building up since the evening before, and they had kept vigil most of the night with the lighthouse keeper, who took his responsibilities most seriously. Very much contrary to their usual ways, their midday meal was also their breakfast. And after the table had been cleared, the three of them passed the time quietly indoors, shut in by the storm. Chiyoko began to long for Tokyo. She longed for the Tokyo where, even on such a stormy day, the automobiles went back and forth as usual, the elevators went up and down, and the streetcars bustled along. There in the city, almost all nature had been put into uniform, and the little power of nature that remained was an enemy. Here on the island, however, the islanders enthusiastically entered into an alliance with nature and gave it their full support. Bored with studying, Chiyoko pressed her face against a window pane and gazed out at the storm that kept her shut up in the house. The storm was a monotone of dullness. The roar of the waves came as persistently as the garrulity of a drunk man. For some reason, Chiyoko recalled the gossip about a classmate who had been seduced by the man she was in love with. The girl had loved the man for his gentleness and refinement, and had even said so openly. After that night, so the story went, she loved him for his violence and willfulness, but this she never breathed to anyone. At this moment, Chiyoko caught sight of Shinji descending the storm-swept stairs with Hatsu snuggled against him. Chiyoko was convinced of the advantages of a face as ugly as she believed her own to be. Once such a face hardened in its mould, it could hide emotions far more cleverly than could a beautiful one. What she regarded as ugly, however, was actually only the plaster of Paris mask of a self-preoccupied virginity. She turned away from the window. Beside the sunken hearth, her mother was sewing and her father was silently smoking his new life. Outdoors was the storm. Indoors, domesticity. Nowhere was there anyone to heed Chiyoko's unhappiness. Chiyoko returned to her desk and opened the English book. The words had no meaning. There was nothing but the lines of type running down the page. Between the lines, the vision of birds wheeling high and low flickered in her eyes. They were seagulls. When I returned to the island, Chiyoko told herself, and made that bet about a seagull flying over Toba's tower, this is what the sign meant.